Welcome to the Future of Teamwork podcast. My name is Dan Grunewald, CEO of the Huddle 3 Group. And uh, today I have Alexi Dunaway joining us. Alexi is the co-founder and CEO of Pinnacle. And uh, he's doing a lot of work in the coaching space, particularly making coaching available on a daily basis to early and mid-level career professionals. So uh, welcome, Alexi. Thanks so much, Dan. Glad to be on our podcast. Coaching's a, a big part of this podcast. We talk to a lot of people about it. And uh, you and I, before the show, were talking about how it has a price point um, and how your positive experiences with coaching has encouraged you into this new business model with Pinnacle. Maybe you could share a little bit more about those positive experiences and, and how you've come to be where you are today. Sure. So I, I came to Pinnacle in part because I've been an executive coach now for the past four years, full time for early to growth stage startup founders and executives. And I saw a really consistent set of problems emerge that they would bring to me and, and built a pretty large content library of articles and tips that I would send in between or frameworks that I would send in between coaching conversations. And ultimately, I realized uh, as part of this process that there was much greater demand for these services, much lower in the organization than could afford the price point of a, a premium executive coach. And mm -hmm. so we built Pinnacle in part to enable that access, following a lot of the methodologies that coaches use, but providing a lot of the content that is foundational to the art of, of management. That's neat. And, and tell me a little bit about your early experiences, like where how did you fall into executive coaching? You don't kind of wake up and say, I'm an executive coach. <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's a good question. I had one. Uh, I found it to be incredibly valuable. For five years, actually, I was CEO of an accelerator in Kenya, and we were working with early stage Kenyan entrepreneurs, uh, providing various forms of consulting support and uh, investment advisory and, and connections and so on and so forth. And as part of building that business, actually, my board recommended I get a coach. I hadn't heard of it before, uh -huh. uh, but it felt really profoundly transformational. And so I then took a lot of the coaching practices that I was learning as part of that relationship, brought them to my team. And ultimately, when I left, decided, hey, there's actually more, more of a science here than I probably am acknowledging. And so yeah. got additional, sought additional training, which I think is really important in the world of coaching. There's a lot of people who don't do that, I think, to their loss and to the loss of uh, managers everywhere. But then it's, it's with that that I really dove deep and built a, built a practice, spent a little bit of time in venture as a coach attached to a fund, and then built out a practice, primarily through word of mouth from entrepreneurs that were finding value. Neat. And... Um... Anything about coaching early stage entrepreneurs that's different in your opinion to, you know, some of the coaches that are out there working with, you know, scaled, you know, more operational, you know, Fortune 100 or whatever it might be as far as a established company? It's a great question. My read is that the challenges that entrepreneurs are facing or that entrepreneurial CEOs are facing is a unique one because they're creating something out of nothing and they're not operating within an organizational structure, which has an inordinate amount of separate challenges and constraints and yeah. opportunities. But there's the ownership that these people feel over their teams that I think senior leaders everywhere feel, but they're also operating in this total band of uncertainty. And so there, and so the demands placed on entrepreneurs too is just incredibly high to not only lead and manage and, and do all that, but figure out the rest of the business too. Yeah, I, I like the way you talk about the band of uncertainty. I was actually doing some training this morning on coaching in our LMS. And um, one of the things that it was saying was, it was trying to assess where you think coaching fits in an organization. One of the questions that it had some data on was, what is the role of an executive coach in helping a, a leader or a manager set tone for the team? And when you're in, when you're a leader of entrepreneur with a lot of uncertainty, it's, it can be pretty uh, chaotic setting tone for the team. So I guess that's yeah. where the coaching relationship's very critical. Yeah. And I think the more senior you go, the more utility the coaching framework has uh, as yeah. something that coaches and leaders can adopt for themselves and, and their own teams. 
Uh, and there's yeah. actually some really interesting transitions too that entrepreneurs are facing in that their role is not changing, their title's not changing, but the way they have to operate with respect to other people and other teams is changing mm -hmm. because as they grow, they're the people that used to do everything. Then they become the people that manage the people that used to do everything. Then they become the people that set the vision and let other people do it. And yeah. in some settings, other people make that progression right throughout their career, but it's accompanied by some delineation of, okay, we are stepping into this new role, into this new title. And for an yeah. entrepreneur, it's all this sort of steady gradient. And all of a sudden you, you wake up and you realize, oh, wait, I have to be orienting myself in a totally different way now that I have this broader stakeholder community group and investor network around me. Uh, yeah. But I didn't, you know, and, and now all of a sudden I have to change, but there's no marker of that. Yeah, that is interesting. So even with the market that we've gone through in the last six to 12 months with a, a big shift towards um, profitability and, and really having a close look at burn rates and things like that, I guess a, an entrepreneur or a founder or leader in one of those businesses has to be having very different conversations. Yeah, absolutely. Very cool. So you use the word there, framework, a couple of times. And I often think about a coach as like, you know, someone who has really good conversations with me, asks me a lot of the questions that point me in the right directions, but I don't often think about them as bringing a, a framework per se that, that I can then use with my team. Are there, are there some good examples of, of coaching frameworks that you've really attached yourself to and, and you see leaders kind of taking forward in, in their daily operations? There's two ways to tackle this, this question for me. The first is my personal opinion as, as a coach. Uh, and then mm -hmm. the second is how we're approaching this through Pinnacle. And, and I'll start yeah. the first and get to the second. As a coach, I don't necessarily think there's a particular framework that is worth following. There are great frameworks that are easy to teach leaders to integrate into their work. Uh, top of mind for me there is the GROW framework. Uh, that was popularized by Sir John Whitmore and performance consultants. But I think practically because it's something you can teach and it's more or less easy to follow. I think yeah. as a coach, you learn that it's a, the beginnings of something, but you know, the, the real coaching relationship is, is much further. Right. And, you know, and obviously there's a lot of other incredible uh, coaching training academies that have their own orientation to the world. What to me is really interesting is at Pinnacle, we're really, we've really built a product for early to mid-level managers. And one of the realizations that we've had in working with that population group, which feels radically different or yeah, it feels radically different than, than the most senior leaders is that they're stepping into a space where the idea of what management is feels really opaque, right? What has brought mm -hmm. them to success so far is you know, delivering effectively on their technical work. And often yeah. we promote them because they're fantastic ICs, but the yeah. role of managing people is very different. And so as you make that transition into being that frontline manager or that mid-level manager, the, the, the sort of call it director level, you're opening your work up to a whole new set of tasks that you don't know are important to do. And it feels really nebulous and abstract. And yeah. it's in that context that we're not bringing in coaching frameworks, but we're bringing in management best practices, how to effectively hold a one-on-one, -on -one, how to delegate, how to have career coaching conversations, how to give feedback, all of the important yeah. aspects and behaviors of managing people that you wouldn't really know if you, if someone didn't help you through it. And the reality is in this day and age, now that we're all virtual, it's much harder to apprentice yourself in the same way that you used to. You can't watch other people manage as well as you used to be able to. And so you're at a loss for how to learn these skills. So maybe you're asking a peer, you're asking your manager, you're Googling, but that takes a lot of time. It's hard to surface the relevant and important content. And you're not integrating that into your workflow and into the into how you operate on a day-to-day -day basis. And, and that challenge is really what, what we built Pinnacle to do, to bring some of those management development frameworks into people's workflows so they begin to adapt them and use them on a day-to-day -day basis. That's neat. Um, 
I like the way you describe, you know, management being opaque to those individual contributors that have just come into it. I think back to one of my first leadership jobs and uh, I was just a billing, I was on desk billing as a recruiter and now I was a team leader. And um, one of my team who was brilliant, Paul, you know, he had 25 years more experience than I did. Um, so I'm like, why am I managing this guy? <laughs> and and how do I have a conversation with him when he knows his customers, his product, his daily routine way better than I do? Um, mm -hmm. And and to your point on apprenticeship, I was able to observe other team leaders in the business sitting down and having conversations throughout the day, not behind closed doors too, because we were in a big open floor environment. And you got to see whose team was doing well. You saw their numbers on the board and you'd be like, I'm going to follow Clinton or Julian or whoever it might have been on the floor that, that you saw doing a good job, or I'm going to take them for a beer and ask how they have one-to-one -one meetings. Mm -hmm. So we have, we have gone from, from, it's no less opaque now than 20 years ago, but now we don't have those interpersonal observational opportunities. Yeah. Particularly for new folks that have never really been in the workforce for a long time or have yep. entered into the workforce in this uh, post pandemic or, or because of COVID, right. And are, and they're the cadre of people that are just now starting to become managers and they're at a loss for, they haven't had any of that physical context of, of what the office looks like. But I yeah. wanted to, to note that one of the more interesting, most common sentiments that's been expressed to me by early and mid-level managers is the exact words, I don't know what I don't know. This yeah. sentiment of not quite confidence in what I'm doing yet, because I don't know what the parameters of the job are. And so I don't know how to measure myself against the parameters that are invisible to me. And yeah. so there's this sense though, that I know I should be doing things. Is there a checklist or is there a place that tells me all of the things that I should be doing so that I can be aware of them and then actually begin to act? And it's, it's particularly at those threshold moments of transition where this feeling emerges independent, you know, um, I think independent of level, this happens at that, at that entry level, this happens when you get yep. promoted to director and NVP too. any of these threshold moments, it's, I know I'm stepping into a new unknown environment. I don't know what, what are the bounds of that environment? And therefore I don't know how to measure myself against it. And in the context yep. of management, that means that a lot of people end up having poor managers because the managers haven't figured out what they're supposed to be doing or how to do it effectively. Yeah. And actually, if you think a level up from that the new manager's manager isn't really coming in and saying, here's the onboarding into the new role. They're saying, why isn't this metric here? You know, right. because exactly. most organizations aren't managing for people metrics. They're managing for customer metrics, sales metrics, product exactly. metrics. Yeah. Which that, I that think is a huge missed opportunity. It is. Yeah. I think there's, I think we should think about embedding into performance management frameworks or competency frameworks that part of being promoted is demonstrating effective management and leadership capabilities because that's ultimately yeah. what will drive effective outcomes down the line. Yeah. In fact, we met at that uh, Transform HR conference in Vegas earlier in the mm -hmm. year and there was some really good products there that were starting to uh, measure and, and manage the optics of, of people analytics, um, which yep. just, you know, historically when you would get promoted into a management role in a lot of organizations, they'd say, did you go through the training? Yes. Have you mm -hmm. hit your objectives, which were generally sales or product or customer? Yes. Um, and, and realistically, do I need to promote you to keep you? <laughs> that was the last part, right? Right. right. Yeah, that's, that's part of the reason why we based what content we're sending at Pinnacle based on a deep understanding of an individual's actual measured behaviors. Yeah. And so you can ask people around them, and this is, you know, coaches will not find this new at all, but starting with a 360 or starting with an upward feedback survey to identify for a given manager, here are the specific behaviors that you should be showing. And yeah, there's a whole lot of research and people science that, demonstrates, hey, which are the most effective behaviors that are linked to overall management effectiveness, that are linked to engagement, that are linked to business outcomes. These are the behaviors that we know we shouldn't be motivating. And so start yeah. by measuring it and then help people 
figure out what they need to do to change it, and then measure it again to show, hey, they've actually changed it. And then that's the point where you really can be thinking about, oh, this person is demonstrating these capabilities. It's not just that they've done the training, but they've actually shown the, living it. the change in the behaviors. That's when we should think about, okay, that's the promotion potential. That's neat. So, yeah, with, your, so with your product then with Pinnacle, um, how much does measurement come in? It sounds like you just referenced that you'll bring a 360 degree tool in at the beginning. Yeah, uh, beginning and quarterly to be okay. able to show measurable progress. We've heard from HR leaders and, and executives that it's all well and good to have training, but what actually matters is behavior change. And yeah. th we need to reorient measurement, not around, you know, are people happy about the training that they did, but are people changing the behaviors that in the, and the way that they act? Yeah. And, and with that 360, because I've used 360s, but never on a quarterly basis, how much is the, is the framework of what's being questioned and observed evolving in, in these businesses? Because I would imagine that's going to be different from team to team. You know, we often have requests to tailor the tailor the the survey and the behaviors that we're motivating to the needs of a specific company, which is different, right? So, yeah, many companies and and depending on size, but many companies will have a specific leadership framework that they want to incentivize or motivate or hold people accountable to or a set of values that indicates they want people to act in this way. Right. And we can embed those into the survey. Now, there are questions in that survey and behaviors that we know are linked to overall management effectiveness that we don't want to pull out. And so it's always a balance there of the customization, but also bringing the expertise that we have and saying, no, it is important that you consistently provide specific praise for good work. Like that's a management behavior yeah. that is really, really, really important. Your people need to be recognizing and using positive reinforcement to motivate people. Yeah. Let's measure that and make sure people are doing that. And if they're not, remind them to do it. Or they need to be giving feedback or they need to be having career conversations because that's a significant indicator as to whether someone is likely to stay. It's actually, I saw some research, maybe this is now about a year old, but uh, lack of career progression is the second most common motivator for people's departure from companies behind compensation. That should be surprising to no one, but if managers aren't having those conversations and keeping that top of mind, then it is very easy for that to fall by the wayside. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And particularly in times of the market, like we've seen for a lot of companies in the last 12 months. Right. Yeah, yeah. No, that's really interesting. Uh, I I've often had conversations with peers, colleagues, bosses around the career conversation. And there has tended, particularly in frontline managers, not so much HR professionals, there's tended to be this sense of, well, why would I talk to Bob or Jenny about career progression if I can't see any career progression? You're like, oh, uh, you know, you're, you're hardly putting faith in your team to create it for themselves here. Like talk about what they want to do and see where the stretch project is or the, the little extra bit right. of learning that they could do or sitting on a committee to get some exposure. I mean, I, I think it's easy for people to get stuck in the day-to-day -day grind and, and probably never more so than coming out of COVID where everyone has been sort of disrupted by where we sit, how we work together, all, all the different distractions that we now have, you know, letting the dog out, tackling the five-year-old before they hit the enter button on your laptop, whatever it might be. Right. And at the same time, there's research that I'm, I'm going to quote the number wrong. I don't remember it exactly, but I think it's upwards of 70. There was a, there was a study that Gallup did of senior leaders to understand what were the factors that contributed most to their growth. And over 70% mm -hmm. of them said being assigned stretch opportunities as the principal factor or as the high, highest leverage factor that contributed to, to their high career growth. And so, yeah, we know it's important, uh, and we need to a lot. We need to have the conversations to let people make the choices, right? And some people might not want that, and that's fine. But the conversations at least need to be had. Yeah, yeah. What are um, as you look across organizations, teams that you've supported, leaders that you've supported? Um, 
You, you mentioned positive feedback reinforcement, you know, more routine feedback cycles and, and career conversations. Um, are there any, that, that can be done very, you know, individually, but are there any really um, programmatic, uh, well-documented approaches to that in an organization that allow you to pull data to see, you know, who's, who's having those conversations, where those conversations are having more traction perhaps? That's a great question. I'm not sure if I know of tools out there that are that are tracking this. I think there are there are obviously programs that you can run to incentivize that these are happening, and there are features of performance management software where you can upload a career development plan and you can basically check, you know, who is actually having them. The challenge that I think we've all experienced is it's it's not great if if performance management conversations and career conversations only end up happening out of compliance, they sit in a drawer and they don't actually mean anything, right? And I've witnessed over and over how poor people yeah. are giving feedback. And so it's not, an, the, the check box isn't quite enough. What you need is the feeling from the direct reports that they're actually having these conversations on an ongoing basis, because it's really easy to have a programmatic intervention that basically says everyone, you know, it's we're coming up on performance review season. Let's incorporate career conversations. Here's a template for the conversation. Do this mm -hmm. for an hour. Everyone report back to me that you did it or share back the plans. And, and, and I don't want to say like, that is helpful, right? Yeah. But if that document then goes in a drawer and is never touched on, well, that's not that helpful, right? Yeah. It then the behavior that that matters is not only having that conversation, but using that conversation as a manager to filter how you provide work or how you divide work and how you support people and what opportunities you offer people and what feedback you give in line yeah. with that career orientation or in line with those performance review uh, goals. And so there's there's a need to, I almost want to say activate these these systems which are which are important to have and and one way to think about this is the difference between a system of record which w there are mm -hmm. actually a lot of on the market right uh, and and there are some great ones right but the difference between that and a system of engagement how do you take the records that you have around performance management and make them live how do you enable yeah. people to have conversations about them on a monthly basis or on a weekly basis weekly is probably a little bit ambitious but yeah. uh, on, on a on a monthly basis at least right yeah definitely that that engagement yeah. piece is is very interesting because i've definitely seen no matter what tool we're using that you do get into review season and you do put a development plan in there and the latest tool we're using is leapsome and it mm -hmm. has some nice it has some nice features because you can have the employee go in and put updates on how far along they are on their development goal, but it's still a bit of a box tick, box ticking exercise. So how you drive the engagement and the excitement, how they get something back from it is, it, it, is still poorly understood in my eyes. Well, I think there you are relying on the manager of that employee to care and you're relying yeah. on them to follow up and them to have the knowledge to develop the person. Right. But in the context of, you know, you, you said this earlier, right? Directors or the mid-level managers are not necessarily developing their uh, emerging managers, their reports are managing people as managers. Yep. They're, they're holding them accountable to goals, but they're not focusing their development conversation. They, they say, great, you need to develop as a better manager, but then they don't provide people the tools or coaching or development to do so. Yeah. And, and I think that's true not only in the context of management, but that's true in the context of, of other skills. And so it's the, it's the next step of how do you use uh, an existing performance management, whether it's Leapsum or, or Lattice or, uh, some, or, or another one of these systems, and then use a tool like Pinnacle on the side of it to basically reinforce the behaviors that you've identified that you need to work on. And not yeah. only leave it to the manager of the manager individual contributor to, to move this conversation forward, but have a third party 
saying, great, you have these goals. Perfect. Well, let's continue to provide you information and nudges to move you in that direction so that you achieve your own career growth because you achieve the, the goals that your manager set for you in the last performance review. Yeah. Yeah. That is interesting. And I want to dig a little deeper on the nudges because you and I've talked about that in the past too, as well as the coaching that, that you can uh, apply with the Pinnacle product. The mm -hmm. It's funny, last week, and this is probably a lead into that deeper dive question. Last week, we had uh, Lisa Fratsky on the show and um, we were talking about humanizing processes and stories. And she talked about a, a project at Disney where they actually made the employee resource guide or, or the or whatever it was that that allowed the cast members i think it was the cast resource guide maybe um to know what the best practices and processes were they turned it into a person that was having human dialogue with them um and and to me when i think about all the different tools and systems we use sometimes it, it does become a box ticking exercise so if you can have a more human interaction with a nudge or with a coach calling you to say hey i'm looking at your dashboard and pinnacle and you've set these goals but you haven't done these things i wonder if that's a, a way to create a bit more accountability um shared fate in in a platform so you're you're speaking to what for me is one of the most exciting frontiers of HR tech solutions moving forward, which is how do we begin to personify best practices? Not, and, and I mean that, you know, in Pinnacle's context, what we have is based on the feedback that you receive from your team, you get twice weekly nudges and sort of short form content in Slack and teams to help you act in a certain way. And then you also have mm -hmm. a coach that's available to you asynchronously that you can text at any time to help you with any management problem you might have. What right. we're actively thinking about is how to incorporate LLMs and chat GPT like functionality, because ultimately it doesn't always need to be a human on the other end of that conversation, right? If you have yeah. a leadership playbook that's 50, 100 pages long, you can put a, a quote unquote face that sits on top of it. If you yeah. have a employee manual, you can put a quote unquote face on top of it that becomes interactive. So the person doesn't have to sift through all of the different pages uh, yeah. to find the best practices for ERGs at, at Disney, but they can just ask a question and it will give you the answer and it will begin to really assist you in that way. And so for me, that is a really exciting next phase of learning and development and HR technology more broadly. That's neat. And and you think that's exciting because it's allowing a human to essentially interface with a uh, a more humane, personable um, gateway to the data rather than having to go and scroll through the 50 pages. Yeah, it just, it sucks to, to go yeah. scroll through the 50 pages, right? Yeah. And you you have that, well, I have a visual memory. And so I remember, okay, it was at the top of this page. It was at the top That's of some right. page. And I think it was in this section, but I don't really remember. And then I waste a bunch of time looking for it. And then I end up there and it doesn't tell me the answer. That I need. Yeah. And so there, I think there's a, there's a massive opportunity to sit on top of, uh, on top of internal documents. I also think there's a massive opportunity to sit on top of leadership frameworks and books because each of these um, leadership training institutions has their own frame. Fr I think there's commonalities amongst all of them, quite frankly. Yeah. We can have that conversation separately, but uh, yeah. they have their own approach, right? And you can make that book sing by putting a front face on it that is attached to an AI model. Yeah, that's cool. It's like the caddy. Am I playing the nine iron or am I going to chip out with my three wood here? <laughs> yeah, exactly. 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 I like that. I like that. And to be honest, I think um, particularly for early to mid-level managers, we talk a lot about psychological safety on the show, but the last thing you want to mm. do when you're busy and your manager's busy and your team's busy is is call a timeout and go and talk about something that seems maybe a little bit marginal. Am I just having a tough day at work and overreacting to a response I got from a team member where if you can go in and have mm -hmm. this 
this conversation, whether it's a chatbot or an avatar or, or whatever else, or click even a small video, mm-hmm. even if it's not purely interactive, it, it might at mm-hmm. least directionally get you moving forwards and, and you don't go and burn an hour, an hour and a half of your own time stressing about how to have the right conversation or worse, just right. don't have the conversation. Right. And, and we think a lot about this in terms of how L&D has been structured and, and where it needs to go. We treat managers as if they're kids and put them in a classroom or an online classroom. Yep. And managers like adults don't learn knowledge for the sake of knowledge. They learn knowledge attached to problems they currently have. And yeah. so the, to the extent that we can build, you know, the link to what we were just talking about is a manager wants an answer to the thing that they're going to, that they're wrestling with, that they're going to bring home to their partner and complain yeah. to them about that they're going to bring to their manager, but, oh, wait, their one-on-one is next Tuesday. And so I need this answer now in order to navigate this situation that's happening in front of me. And yeah. so how do we shift this, our, our thinking around what managers need, not only to content broadly written, but to the right content at the right time to solve the right problem that the manager has in front of them. And the way we currently solve that is with a human that you can talk to. And we think there's advantages and disadvantages with that. But yeah. there's opportunity for that, as we were just talking about, to be solved or for that role to be played, at least in part, by a large language model. Yeah, no, I, I like that. And you're absolutely right. Attacking a problem that exists right now, it means something to you. It's not just going yeah. through a... Uh, a long list of best practices that you may need in the next six months or 12 months. Um, That is cool. And there's a, there's a, there's a, there's a tough balance there to strike because on some level people aren't always aware of the things that they need to be doing and you need to elevate them or or you need to elevate those things that they should be doing, but they don't know that they should be doing yet but you also need to solve the problem that they have in front of them. And so the art becomes, how do you use technology to to surface and connect the problem that they have to the solution set that you know, or set of behaviors that you know that they should be working on and and make make that link in a way that feels personalized to that person in that situation. Yeah, yeah, I like that. I know uh, years ago I did some work with Schlumberger uh, and they had a, one of their operations down in Latin America and they created this learning environment where individuals were encouraged to come back and say, hey, I dealt with this problem in the field and here's, mm. here's who I spoke to and this is what I did. And so people could go back in and access the catalog and if they saw a similar problem, they could say, hey, how did Alexi deal with that problem when he was in Venezuela? Um, and I wonder in your platform or, or in others, how much is that second order learning going to be part of the future of learning and development? Because it's one thing to say, hey, I went and used a Pinnacle product or a piece of training attached in Leapsum or LinkedIn learning, but, but to then go and have a conversation with peers about, hey, I, I did that training and I did this and Bobby responded really well or Jenny took it and gave me this feedback and I realized the problem was over here. I think those are the stories that that, that actually bring the whole team along. Um, mm-hmm. And I, I wonder like whether it's through human intervention or through evolution of best practices, whether whether you're starting to see that with any of the, the customers that are using your product and, and starting to do this kind of daily iterative coaching. So for me, the best place to look for solutions there is actually in the consulting world. I think that's the environment that has done so well with this knowledge management, right? When you look at the largest consulting companies in the world, your McKinsey's uh, and Baines and BCG's, what makes them so successful is that they have a person who saw something that looked like this once and they already have half a deck written and they know who the right people to talk to are. And so it accelerates the process of learning in a really fast way. Yeah. And so it, it also takes a lot of time and, and that's part of the reason, I mean, it's part of what you're paying for is that uh, wealth of 
people knowledge and expertise and basically the the optimization mechanism of how do you extract knowledge and and manage this knowledge that is in the heads of so many people at such scale but yeah. how how we're actively integrating it into the product right now is a number of our clients have asked us to build out peer learning modules and so we do that regularly and we think our managers who are using the product love it it's an opportunity you know, I mentioned this don't know what I don't know sentiment earlier Yeah. to, to sort of circle back. The idea that other people are wrestling with the same challenges that you are is tremendously comforting. I think in all walks of life with, with every problem, right? There's some yeah. uh, commonality and suffering, I guess. But uh, <laughs> in this context, it's, it is helpful for managers to hear from peers about the, the challenges that they're confronting regardless of whether or not they have an answer just because it yeah. creates the the space to feel a little bit more confident that no there is no right answer quote unquote as there often isn't in in management there is a yeah. path that i tried and it worked with some degree of success and there's opportunities to to learn from that setting that's neat and i love i love peers and obviously it ties in neatly to teams when you've got peer learning you might not be yeah. the same functional team but you're a team for the purpose of learning together and sharing best practices. Um, so I think that's a really powerful way to learn. So what does that look like if you do a peer learning module? Is it rather than just doing something digital, they come together and do an interactive process? That's right. And uh, that's, yeah. that's currently structured as, a, as live calls with, with peers that are facilitated by a coach. Nice. Yeah. Yeah, that's really interesting. Because you're right, there, there is a bit of... Um, comfort in knowing others are suffering but we, we recently did a uh, a conflict management uh training module with my vistage group which is a peer peer-to-peer -peer sort of learning environment and what was interesting was the the construct that, that this gentleman shared with us which was when someone's stressed out they need to know that they matter that they're valued that you have empathy, that you understand why they feel a certain way and that you're going to work with them to solve the problem. So it was that matter, value, empathy problem. Mm -hmm. um, and I thought that was a really cool construct. And in a peer learning environment, um, people aren't going to put their hand up and say, I have a problem with this difficult team member. But if they start realizing that everyone else is trying to help each other with the same problem, maybe they will be more open in sharing their problem and they'll realize that hey, we're here to talk about this for a reason because we know it exists and you guys don't, don't deserve to be guessing your way through this. Let's, let's, let's share some experiences and see if we can collectively problem solve. And that to me too is how you construct the space so that people feel comfortable and confident being able to share and what the facilitation practices and processes are and who's in the room. And so what we have found is, you know, you have a peer manager that's on your, in your function on a different team, yeah. that's slightly, well, that's slightly easier to share with than another manager that's on your team who knows all, all of your people, right? Yeah. Which is then it's like, oh, I can't really talk about the specifics of my problem because they're sort of confidential and this person that's sitting next to me will know exactly what I'm talking about. And so you know, in the function, but on a different team is, is potentially a little bit better in a different function is potentially even a little bit better. And so the, there's also organizational benefits of bringing together people from different teams and, yeah, and creating connectivity and networks there, but it also enables people to operate in a different way. And also it, the dynamics of call it power and positionality call it seniority yep. within the company matters yep. a lot to a, a junior person and a really senior person in those peer learning settings will have difficulty finding the same commonality that two senior level people or two junior level people people will yeah that's that is smart and that's i've definitely observed that in some of the groups that i've pulled together at work um and it, and to your point as well it it goes back to the facilitator or the coach who's in there because if they set the right ground rules, they can find ways to bring people into that conversation in the right yeah. way too. I know in our group, we always have a, you know, you've got to use I statements. You can't say, well, yep. we experienced this. You've got to be like, I found this. And, you know, I need you guys to tell me if I was right, wrong or otherwise. 
um, because otherwise it's too abstract and, and veiled. Mm-hmm. Incidentally, a great practice for, for giving feedback and, and yes. one that we recommend a lot. Use I statements. Don't say you or, or we or just objectively, this is bad, but your yeah. perceptions are uh, much e- My perceptions are much easier for you to hear than an objective reality that you can test. Yeah. 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 Very cool. Um, well, we've covered a lot there. I mean, it is, it's really interesting just looking back through my notes here around some of those core curriculum elements that, that you'll be bringing people through on the, on the pinnacle platform, you know, positive reinforcement, feedback, career conversations. Um, I, I really like this whole, uh, activation concept as well um, mm. because you're right too much learning is too much learning and these individuals are busy already i mean yeah as soon as they get told oh here's more training they're like oh i'll never get my job done <laughs> yeah. um, so creating activation and real-time nudges or hey text the coach deal with the real problem i think that's super powerful and, and this concept of, of peer learning modules as well um, what's your and you shared the personified um, platform approach, but what is your view for like how teams are really working at their best? If you roll forward five years, you know they're on pinnacle, they're having just great success. What what what's that going to look and feel like for early and and mid career managers that that's different from today? I get to predict the future, huh? Yeah, that's the fun part. That's the fun part. This, this is all the also the part where I get myself into trouble. Uh, <laughs> What keeps coming to mind for me when you ask that question is what are the new ways of working that we have established that are going to stick? And I think something that we're still trying to figure out is this balance of hybrid and remote and in person. And I feel pretty confident that we've, we've stuck on hybrid almost forever, depending it, there's, there's significant exceptions dependent on industry, right? Yeah. But that some form of hybrid is going to be dominant, particularly for for knowledge work, I guess is what I'm specifically talking about. Mm -hmm. And in that context, how do you find ways to create sufficient space for the collaboration that needs to happen, create, you know, break down some of the silos, provide the communication that people wouldn't otherwise get? Social scientists call the physical environment a strong environment because there are a lot of contextual cues. And you and me talking on Zoom lacks the, it's it's a weak environment. It doesn't have all the contextual cues of the office and what everyone else is doing. And so hybrid, I guess, modifies that a little bit or or helps provide a little bit more of the of the strong context there. That's why people like it. But we're going to continue to have people who are going to stay remote. And so the way that, you know, whether it's documentation first cultures where everything is written down and more stuff is done asynchronously, I think is a really important push. An increase of company-wide communication. And there's a company out there that I really admire called PIN, which is trying to make all employee communications bite-sized and sort of bringing them to people in the flow of work because there's so much information out there that uh, it's easy to get overwhelmed by. And so I think the secret to what will make teams successful is navigating some of these split geographic differences and Mm -hmm. global differences. I mean, we have team members in in Pakistan and the Philippines and and we're an early stage startup. Everyone has these because access to talent is is global in a way that, you know, I'm not going to say in a way that it never was, right? This has been a movement for call it the past 30 years, but even Mm -hmm. more so now than ever before is this real. And there's a whole host of companies that have been set up to enable you to manage global workforces uh, on not just global workforces working independently in those settings, but global workforces working together on problems that everyone is is facing, which I think is a is a small distinction. There are even global multinationals, right? Yeah. But uh, 
you know, your European office is focused on Europe and your, and you know, your South Asia office is focused on South Asia. Uh, and, and now you have people everywhere working on every team. And so how do you enable that effectively? And, and I think it comes down to better communication, uh, and yeah, I don't know, creating, creating I like space for people to have meaningful conversations. I, I like that. Uh, to me, that's talking about the fluidity of teams, um, mm -hmm. which perhaps hasn't been very fluid in the last 30 years. Even when we've offshored, it's been like that team does this work on these hours and they don't really play with these guys. They go, they go, go through a, a team lead or some other conduit. But mm -hmm. uh, that, that picture that you're painting for me says that teams, wherever they're at, whatever function or discipline they're in, they're finding ways to to, to play well with each other, um, mm -hmm. which I think is good. You know, the friction is problematic at the best of times. Right. That's really I'm neat. Sorry. Well, it's been, it's been a really fun conversation, Alexi. I took a ton of notes. I, um, I've definitely made a few highlights for myself on giving more uh, positive reinforcement because I still suck at that. Um, that's one of those ones you got to wake up daily and say, get better at that. Uh -huh. um, Absolutely. But if... Uh, but if any of our listeners want to reach out to you and learn more about um, Pinnacle and the work that you're doing, how do they best find you? Easy. Uh, you can check out our website, which is heypinnacle.com, or you can email me at alexi at heypinnacle.com and happy to have a conversation. Would, would love to chat with anyone about what we're working on and how we might make it better and how we might connect it to the needs that you have. I love it. And I've got to ask the question, heypinnacle.com, is there going to be like a Hey Siri or just be like Hey Pinnacle and I'll just respond to you in the future? I, you know, quite possibly. Or uh, <laughs> I, 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 may, maybe give me some ideas here, Dan. <laughs> That's very cool. Actually, here's my Siri talking to me now that I said it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. On demand. Cool. All right. Great well, conversation. Thanks again, Alexi. Thanks so much for having me on. You bet.